steel story um it's almost now got into be mythical proportions and really the story started with richard and mark um and richard and mark came to yosemite in 1982-83 a little bit of climbing but hadn't come to yosemite to do big wall climbing and they hadn't done any big walls in yosemite so here they come and they decide they're going to do a big wall and they're going to do el cap and they're going to do el capitan and they're going to climb what's called the slab at that point it was called the slab and everybody knew about it everybody knew that the great slab was there everybody knew that it someday it would be climbed but at that point there was other lines on el cap that hadn't been climbed that were more natural that people thought they'd climb these cracks and they thought that was a much more natural way of doing it um, so richard and mark came and they set their sights on the great slab and the great slab is a blank section that goes for almost 900 feet and that created controversy because they picked this route and there was all this community this climbing community that existed in the park and the climbers in that community are very at the time were very provincial not unlike surfers who kind of control their beach and don't like other people coming to surf their waves these guys thought nobody should climb this rock until they become part of our community they weren't necessarily asking for people to ask permission to climb but they wanted to know that the res proper respect was paid and they'd get to know the community a little bit and you sort of almost had to be blessed by these guys so that community was made up of a bunch of climbers who lived in the park at that time and, and frequented the park a lot so richard and mark come to town come to yosemite and set their sights on it and they weren't necessarily guys who who got real social and got involved in the in the community they just won't came to climb so they start their climb and they go up the first 120 feet the first pitch and a pitch is a rope length um, so the first pitch is from the ground up to the first anchors where they're going to stop set up their what's called a belay where you hold the next person they're going to haul some of their gear up there and then they'll be off and going so richard and mark do that they come back down and they're going to haul more stuff up there these guys haul 1200 pounds of stuff up that wall so that means they had to carry it all to the base when they were getting more supplies and they were gone for the day they came back and somebody had cut down their ropes and not only had they cut down their ropes they'd shit all over their ropes that were laying on the ground um, so that became this really controversial thing and it's interesting to me that somebody would do that and there's been all this discussion over the years over this 30-year span of who were the guys who were the guys that did that and it's really um, it's kind of unimportant who did that um, the people there was all these names that got thrown out there was people whose avatar had a certain name and people thought they were certainly the guy and maybe they were maybe they weren't and it really doesn't matter what's interesting is that somebody at some point decided they were gonna do that they were actually gonna do that to their ropes and that to me is kind of the most interesting thing not who did it but that they did do it that it, they sat around and decided this is what we're going to do and so Richard and Mark had to suffer that they suffered you know physical um, abuse they suffered um, certainly a lot of verbal abuse they were surrounded in the parking lots they were surrounded in the store people telling them they can't do this um, what are they doing they're gonna carry them out in a box all kinds of horrific things to their credit they just decided we're going to do it anyway. Now most people would just decide, you know, I'm not going to put up with this. I'm just going to leave. This is dangerous. They've already vandalized my ropes. They've cut down my lines. They've done everything they possibly could to keep me from climbing. But what do Richard and Mark do? They keep going. So they get up and they do pitch one. They haul their stuff. They do pitch two. They just keep going and going and going. And they don't stop. And they spend 39 days on the wall. Now that's crazy in itself um, people make a lot of that 39 days that it took them too long and how you know they spent all this time up there and it's really because they didn't know what they were doing and you know until somebody climbs that route how do you really know that they didn't know what they were doing um, they were pretty competent guys to spend that much time on the rock so they get up there and as they're moving up some climbers on other routes move alongside them move above them 
They throw beer cans down at them, full beer cans. They throw bags of feces down on top of them. They do everything they possibly can to keep these guys from being successful. These guys don't stop. They keep going. And at the time, it was one of those things that people knew this climb was going on, and the climbing community really got split. And people were kind of, you know, hesitant to get behind these guys because the community was a community of really well-established climbers. And sort of what, what they said is what people believed. And they said these guys shouldn't do the route, so people believed that. So there was a lot of negative press going on. Um, at that time, climbers didn't necessarily seek out press. They were more or less kind of underground. It was a very, very small community back then. And there might have been, you know, a few hundred climbers that frequent in Yosemite at any one time. So there wasn't a lot of people out there doing this stuff. And these guys were doing it at a place nobody thought they should do it. And at a level, people thought that they weren't good enough to do. So they made it to the top, 39 days. And a lot of people made a, a case of the fact that they were Seventh Day Adventists and they didn't climb on Saturdays because for them that's the Sabbath. Um, and people said, well, you know, there was all these days they didn't climb, four or five days over the course of 39 days. And 39 days is a long time. Um, if you climb any route on El Cap for any real length of time, some people do spend a lot of days just resting. You might take a rest day, hang out on a hammock, hang out on a ledge. So it's not unheard of that people don't climb on certain days. But the reason these guys didn't climb became an issue. Um, and if you think about 39 days up on a wall, um, that's 39 days of being uncomfortable. That's 39 days without a shower. That's 39 days living on a ledge, living on vertical terrain, not walking on flat ground, eating bad food, and having every problem you could ever have in your life on flat ground up on a wall. And, and you're scared. There's no question when you climb something like that, it's scary, it's mentally taxing. So if you think about being afraid, if you are nearly in a car accident, you might be afraid for three seconds. Maybe you get afraid in something else for 39 seconds. Maybe you get afraid for 39 hours, which would be phenomenal to be afraid for that many hours. So think about that, you're afraid for 39 days consecutively. So they make it to the top. After 39 days, they walk on the summit. They thought they were going to, you know, have all these accolades and they really got a serious backlash. And when they got back to the Northwest and got back home, they started to do some slideshows, which is not unheard of at the time. People have been doing slideshows about their climbs forever. But because this climb was really controversial, they took a lot of heat for doing their slideshows. They were you know, sort of looked like they were trying to get famous and capitalize on this climb, and people didn't really do that back then. There was, a, there was no internet, there was no email, there was no forums. All this stuff came later. So they really got vilified in the climbing press. And Climbing Magazine came out once a month, so there was all these letters about it. The next month there would be responses and rebuttals to it. So it wasn't necessarily this instantaneous thing. Um, then Richard wrote a book, and people got really upset that he wrote a book. They thought he was trying to get famous, and they thought he was trying to capitalize on the climb. Again, people have been writing books about climbing forever, um, but they got upset about him writing this book because he did a route they didn't think he should do. They did a route they thought he spent too much time on, that he wasn't qualified to do, and it said things on the cover and on the back jacket that Richard never said. But the publisher put these things on there. It was the hardest climb in Yosemite. It was a world record on the wall, none of which Richard ever said. But it became the lightning rod for the climbers. Most people never read the book. Most climbers never read the book. They just immediately jumped to judgment. So then what happens is 29 years go by. During that 29 years, a lot of people tried to climb Wings of Steel. A lot and a lot of really good climbers. Several guys who are very, very well known and really good at what they do made it to the first pitch. Some made it to the second pitch, again, which is a rope length, and said, This is too scary, I'm not going any farther. So they came down. But 
they didn't get any respect. Richard Mark still didn't get respect for this because what it was what people thought they did was drill their way up, that it was a fabricated and contrived route. And when you drill holes in the rock and you use them, they think that's a contrived what but the entire climbing sport is contrived. If you're going to put things into a rock to protect yourself that weren't originally there, that's kind of contrived. Every sport's contrived, and basketball's contrived. It comes up with rules, and you got to throw the ball in the basket. It's a contrived thing. So this sport, they thought, this particular climb, they thought, went beyond the pale of being contrived. So for 30 years now, people have just sort of vilified them. And when the Internet started, people went after them again. 2006, on an Internet forum, somebody posted a very simple question. And the question was, has there ever been a second ascent of Wings of Steel? 2006 to now, you know, years later, there's been several thousand posts responding to that. And bottom line was, nobody repeated the route. And along comes Aaron McNeely, the only guy who could really climb the route and have the credibility to explain what actually went on up there. Now here we are, talking about Wings of Steel as having a second ascent.